Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started because I know um, several of you have to go to class at one o'clock. Um, so I one want to thank all of you for coming here on such short notice. Um, my name is Erin Corcoran. For those of you who I haven't met yet, um, I direct the Social Justice Institute here at the law school. And this is our first event for the semester. Um, and also, just to keep in mind, tomorrow we have a Meet the SJI faculty reception at 5.30 um, in the third floor of the library. So you all are invited to attend that as well. Um, so I'm really happy and excited to be here today to introduce Sandra Fluke, who's going to be speaking to you. Um, and it's actually uh, quite coincidental because a couple of months ago, several law students approached me and wondered about the possibility of getting her to come here to speak at the law school because they were just so struck by her courage and her willingness to stake, take a stand um, and just the dignity in, in which she dealt with the backlash that ensued um, from her um, willingness to speak up on an issue that was close to her heart. Um, and so at that point, I didn't know how that would be possible. And then this event um, kind of fell into our lap. So we're really fortunate to have her here today. Um, and I remember um, when I first heard about her, Sandra Fluke, um, two things struck me. Um, the first was, as a Georgetown grad myself, I couldn't believe that 12 years later, um, she was still fighting the same issues that we at the law school were fighting um, when we were there. And I was also struck by her willingness to kind of take that issue and go public with it. Um, the second thing that struck me about her was that um, in her third year of law school, um, in the midst of probably being involved in a lot of coursework, trying to figure out where she was going to work, um, maybe doing clinical work and pro bono work, she was willing to take time out and put a personal face to a really important issue. And as a result of that, she received quite a lot of personal backlash. Um, very nasty things were said about her personally. And she, the, the level of professionalism and dignity and how she dealt with that um, really um, get, get, earned my admiration. So um, I'm really happy to have her here. And it's no surprise that I think if you look at what she's, been, what she's done historically in her life, that she, in fact, was willing to take a stand and stand up. Um, before she came to Georgetown Law School, um, and after she graduated from Cornell, um, she spent time in New York City at the Sanctuary for Families um, and created an, an initiative there, uh, which brought service, services to victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. She also served on the Manhattan Bur Bureau um, President's Task Force on Domestic Violence and co-founded the New York State-wide Coalition for Fair Access to Family Court. Um, she also successfully lobbied for legislation that allowed LGBTQ teen and other victims of intimate partner violence to access civil orders of protection. She recently graduated from Georgetown University Law Center, cum laude. Um, she was a public interest law scholar um, while she was at the law school and also received a certificate in refugee and humanitarian protection. Um, and I just also wanted to um, say that the dean, Dean Broderick, um, is unable to be here today with us. He's in Asia, meeting with alumni from around different parts of the um, Asian continent. And But he did want me to tell you that he is very excited that you're here, and he very much admires you for your work. So with that, if you could all join me in uh, welcoming Sandra Fluke. Thank you guys so much. It's uh, it's what first week of class is that about? Yeah, not for me. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to continue to enjoy that for a few more weeks, and uh, and when you're right after the bar, you will also enjoy that. So I'm I'm really glad that we're here in the first week of of school while you still have time to think about anything other than classes, and I appreciate you joining us here today. Um, so I'm told that I should speak a little bit about what brought me to this, uh, this strange point. And I want to share that actually because I think it was one of the most valuable things that I got out of law school. And so perhaps it will be something that inspires someone else to, to take on something of a, a similar type of experience and be valuable for you as well. Um, as was mentioned earlier, at Georgetown we didn't have, and we still don't have actually, access to contraception through our insurance. And I had several friends who were fellow students who needed contraception for important reasons other than preventing unintended pregnancy. They needed to be able to uh, prevent cysts 
from growing on their ovaries. One had polycystic ovarian syndrome. And because she couldn't afford the, the very expensive type that was required for her, she actually ultimately lost her ovary. And of course, that will be a, a significant challenge in being able to, to have children one day. And she called me and, and told me that was happening. And I, I got the voicemail from her as I walked out of a final exam. And I, I mean, you guys have been through final exams in law school, and you know you're, that's a time when you're, you're pretty stressed out and you feel like one last thing, and it's, it's going to be too much. You can't take it anymore. And when I heard her voice saying that she'd been in the emergency room all night and the incredible pain she'd been in and the, the kind of surgery she was going to have and that this was happening to her, it was just one straw too many. And I thought, well, this just this isn't going to stand. We're, we're going to have to change this. And so women on our campus and men as well were part of our campaign organized to try to work on this policy and to try to make sure that the administration understood the impact on women of not having the, the full range of health care access that they needed. And it really was sort of a, a law school boot camp. We, you know, drafted uh, letters and did surveys among the students and did all kinds of advocacy. We met with the administration. I, uh, you guys will appreciate this. This is like my law school crowd. I had uh, one of the university counsel tell me that I was going to make a very fine lawyer. And I said, I think you will make a very fine lawyer too. Can we talk about what I wrote in my brief? Um, and it, you know, we engaged in all that different type of advocacy. And ultimately, we found that the Affordable Care Act was going to be our best chance. For, for remedying this situation. And we were really concerned because the, the Affordable Care Act has a provision that you've probably heard about at this point that guarantees women access to preventive care. Not just contraception, but things like breast cancer screenings, domestic violence screenings, and it does a lot for preventive care for children as well, immunizations. There's just an entire range of services that are coming into effect. But we were concerned because the provision was really under attack and especially in the conservative House of Representatives. And no one was talking about what this was going to do to especially students, students who were attending Catholic and Jesuit schools and didn't have this access. And so we put together a press conference, and I guess we did OK. <laughs> we got a little bit of attention, and ultimately I was asked to testify before that, that House committee. And I, I assume you, you sort of know some of what happened from there. Um, but that really was what, uh, what brought all of this about. So just you know, for a moment, I'll encourage you to find something here on your campus that you really feel passionately about, and, or find something in your community, and organize and, and work on it in that way, because it was the most important experience for me during law school in terms of sharpening my advocacy and organizing skills and drafting. You know, we wrote uh, comments to HHS on regulations. We lobbied members of Congress. Uh, eventually, I attempted to tell the president what I thought about the policy, but he just kept saying, no, no, Sandra, I want to make sure you're OK. And I said, but I want to talk about the policy. <laughs> um, so it, it really was a, a great experience in terms of training as well as just having a positive impact on our community. So I hope you'll all find something that you feel passionately about and work on as well. Um, but what I feel passionately about right this minute is I'm working on President Obama's presidential campaign. And I should clarify, I'm not working on it. I'm volunteering. I'm going around the states and talking about it. And as a, a recent law graduate, not a student, ha -ha, that will probably continue throughout the t today's presentation. Um, it's, it's important to me that we talk about the actual policies that are involved, that we cut past the rhetoric and you know, the labels and, and whatever else, and look at what are people's actual records. And you've probably heard a good bit about President Obama's record. You know, he has a little bit of a platform. Um, so you know about the Affordable Care Act. And I, I hope that you know about the attacks on Planned Parenthood that have been happening. You know, I just find it really stunning, really staggering, that when this House of Representatives came into office in 2010, the very first piece of legislation that Representative Ryan and the other members of the Republican caucus passed was to defund Planned Parenthood. So your law students, I can get into the nitty gritty. Federal funding has not gone to abortion other than incest or the life of the woman or cases of rape in decades. 
it does not fund elective abortion. So when we talk in the New Hampshire legislature and in the federal legislature about defunding Planned Parenthood, we're talking about cutting funds for breast cancer screenings, for contraception, for cervical cancer screenings, and other aspects of women's health care. Now, I do not understand the mindset that says, okay, it's day one, I've been elected to Congress, what's the most important thing I can do for this country? What is the most critical thing facing this country? And the answer you come up with is to cut money for breast cancer screenings? I mean, seriously, I haven't figured out how to end that sentence yet because I just, I'm just like, what is that? Like, what is that decision? But President Obama has stu stood firm against those types of attacks. And he has, he has really been a, a, a stalwart supporter of our right to decide how many children and when we have children and what kind of family we want to have. And I've talked to a lot of young people who say to me things like, well, it's not actually possible to turn back Roe v. Wade. That's not really going to happen. Or, you know, sure, sure, this is all rhetoric about women's reproductive rights being under attack. It's, you know, you can use whatever rhetoric you want. It's just factual. The House has had an unprecedented number of bills to limit women's access to reproductive health care over the last two years. I mean, seriously, go, look at the numbers. Please, look at the numbers, because that will make the case far better than I can that this is something real that is happening. And I don't understand the, the mentality of saying, well, it's not really going to happen. They're not really doing it. They're just stirring up their base, whatever. What, what more proof are we looking for than when Representative Ryan co-sponsors bills, votes for bills? He's an elected official, and he is putting these bills forward and voting for them. That, you know, that's doing it. <laughs> we just need a few more people doing it, and then that is real. So when he is co-sponsoring bills that are, make distinctions about which types of rape survivors can access abortion, or which, uh, you know, which types of victims of violence should have access to services with the, the Violence Against Women Act. Those are very real things that, that he believes and that Mr. Romney has supported as well. When he was governor, Governor Romney vetoed a bill that would have guaranteed a rape victim access to emergency contraception in an emergency room. He vetoed that. And Mr. Ryan co-sponsored a bill that would allow a woman, allow a hospital to deny abortion care to a woman who walked into the ER and was literally, it, she needed it right then and there to save her life. You know, it, it's just, it's stunning to me that these are positions that they have taken and it's, it's frightening because we have a, a very, a very significant threat that we're facing in this country and we have a very real choice in November. So I hope you will just, you know, do the research. You should get some sort of extra credit for it, you know, <laughs> statutory research, legislative record, look at the, the committee hearings, and, and look at the information because it's there and this is real. This is what's happening. And it's our generation that will suffer for it. So even if you're not convinced by me on who you should vote for, um, I hope that you will get involved with, issue, with uh, helping to make sure that everyone can vote. We've seen, you know, just really, really terrible legislation across the country, including in New Hampshire, to limit folks' access to the ballot box, to try to, I think, scare people away and make it more difficult for them to vote. You know, if you, don't, uh, if you don't want people to vote, then there's something really wrong with your positions if you'd rather keep voters away. But it's critical that we have as many supporters as possible at the ballot box helping to make sure that people understand their right to vote and are not intimidated by or confused by some of the information that's been put out there. I know that there have been campaigns here in New Hampshire to say that you'll lose your federal loans if you register to vote here and you came from another state. And that's just not true. There's, there's blatant misinformation out there. So it's really critical that students understand that you can go this November with a student ID. You can sign an affidavit. If you live and go to school in New Hampshire, you can vote in New Hampshire. It's an important swing state. This is the place where, where I would register <laughs> if I had a choice. I'm just putting that out there.
Um, so it's an important place to register to vote. And you don't have to have passed the bar or anything like that. But law students are going to be amazing volunteers at the polls. And I really hope that, that many of you will take the time to, to sign up to participate in that process. Um, so I think with that, we're going to do some questions. I know some of you have to get off to class, but um, just to ask questions um, both about your work that you're doing now or some of the other work that you've been involved in. I know you've been really um, a, a true, ad a big advocate for uh, ending human trafficking and domestic violence. We're really fortunate to have in our, in our audience today Sue Carbon, who's been a real um, champion here in the state and also in the national um, arena. She was the most previously former director of the Office Against Violence of, Against Women um, at the Department of Justice, and before that was a family court judge here in New Hampshire. Um, so I would just encourage you to take advantage of having this incredible um, resource here. You know, ask questions about whether, you know, it's about the issues she's working on, about what it's like to be a law student, what kind of advice she might have to give to you. Um, take advantage of this opportunity. So. And feel free, you can just stand up, say, say your name. Um, the room is actually mic'd throughout, so you don't need to run up the microphone up and down the aisles. You can also ask me, you know, what's it like to be called a slut? You know, it's, it's fine. It's really OK. Yes. I'm Ledea. I'm a one out. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like us. Yeah. Um, when you get to the end of it, uh, the end of 1L, you'll realize that it was awful. But for now, it's just normal. It's okay. You're going to be okay. <laughs> Can you describe your experience personally testifying mm -hmm. before the court? Because I'm, I'm curious to see yeah. how that actually impacted you as a person. Well, it, it meant that I missed my immigration class then. <laughs> um, in retrospect, I still think it was a good decision. <laughs> um, so I, one of the things that I don't think has been clear is that I was part of a, a group of students. And so we literally wrote testimony together and edited and worked on this. And what we wrote about was sharing those stories, like the one that I, I shared at the beginning, of, of how this would affect women. And it was... Uh, you know, it was it was a, a good experience. It it felt good to be able to to give a more of a, a megaphone, more of a microphone to those women who weren't being heard, and and how this would impact them. And by the time I actually did it, I wasn't all that nervous because I'd been talking about this stuff so much and had been you know just bothering everyone I could find in the halls at school that I, I was very comfortable discussing it. And I think the, the only question I didn't know the answer to in the, um, in the committee hearing was how much my tuition was, which came off badly because they don't realize that the reason you don't know how much your tuition is is that it's so astronomical that you just don't want to think about it. <laughs> There's no way you're paying it anyway. You just sign the loan papers and close your eyes. Um, but you know that was a, it was a great opportunity to be able to, to speak with Congress about that. Yes? Were you surprised at the extent of the conservative backlash and you know, the and all that? Um, yeah. And how did that sort of, how did that affect you as a person? I think in some ways it was surprising and in some ways it wasn't, right? You know, it, it's surprising to see it in 2012. It's surprising at how just sort of base it was, how, you know, right, like yuck. Um, but at the same time, it was a very old play out of a very old playbook, right? Like, you know, we've, we've seen this happen to women before. And one of the things that I've actually realized since then is how common it still is. Um, I don't know if I'll, any of you are on Twitter, at Sandra Fluck. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, on Twitter, I, you know, I try to put things out there because, as, as I said, my, my whole thing is about just trying to get information to people. And I just get this constant stream of the most disgusting rhetoric and t attacks. I will not tell you what they've said about my reproductive organs. You don't want to know. You know, it's just, it just goes on and on. And what is remarkable to me is the other women who are included on the tweets, the other women who are getting these kinds of attacks, I'm sure that the congresswoman probably experiences that kind of thing. It's, it's actually, I think, something that most women who are in elected office especially experience on a daily basis. And that's what's been really surprising to me is that there is still this, this major undercurrent of this kind of language and this kind of hate, because it, it, it really is hate. 
And so I know you're all going to class, but I want you to know I don't appreciate this. <laughs> no, enjoy your class. Um, no, thank you. So it's, that's what's been startling to me. And one of the things I've been thinking about is that perhaps what has changed over the, you know, the last few decades is that it's just been less socially acceptable to say it publicly, but people still think these things and think that they can say it privately and they can reach out and send you a note that says these things. So that's what I've been thinking about is how do we address the actual, the, the source of this, this hatred, this misogyny, and make it less about what it's okay to say in public and more about understanding why this is being thought and, and changing people's thinking patterns about it. I haven't come up with the like ray gun solution on that one yet, but yeah. Any other questions? Um, right now, politics are you know, pretty heated on both sides. Yeah, so, I noticed that. <laughs> so, so discourse on both sides kind of seems to be a little bit non-existent. Can we do anything about that? What do we do? Well, I, I agree with you. I think it's really, it's really difficult. It's something that I've been struggling with in the, the position that I've been is, you know, what am I comfortable saying and what am I not comfortable saying? And what I try to use as my guideline is that I want it to be informative. I want it to be about actual records, actual policies, and I don't really need to distort anything. You know, the, So that's what I try to focus on, is information. I think we don't always give the American people enough credit for, for what they will understand and what they you know, care about and are looking for, and I don't think they're necessarily always looking for this kind of just really sensational characterizations all the time that don't really give you information. So that's what I try to focus on. And it's, it's not always easy, because when you're in the, the passion of some of these uh, interviews and things, it's, you know, it's heated and, and you get pushed to try, I think sometimes press want you to say the most sensational thing because that's you know, a big story, right? So I give uh, those who are in the, the spotlight, uh, I cut them some slack on, on some of this. But I think it's really important that as the, the public, we also start asking for that and saying, you know, yes, what Representative Aiken said was awful. Awful, I assume you all know what Representative Aiken said about legitimate rape and all of that. Um, that was awful, but that was a statement. And yes, it says something about him, but let's talk about what he's voted for because he's voted for things that are consistent with the statement, and that's actually much more problematic. When he votes for distinctions between rape survivors, he votes for no access to abortion for, for rape survivors. So it's, that's much more important, in my opinion, and that's where I try to drive the conversation, is let's get back to the record, let's get back to the actual policies, because then a person can't come up on television the next day and say, I misspoke. That's crap. You didn't misspeak. Did you misvote? Did you miss co sponsor? That's crap. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I, I'm Dave Robbins. I'm not a law student, a uh, member of the House of Representatives here in New Hampshire. And uh, from a, a, a tactical and or strategic point of view, should you be sending a uh, thank you note to Rush Limbaugh? <laughs> because had it not been for him and other folks the same help, you wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be listening to you. Uh, your piece of this message would not be out there. And to what extent are you willing to accept what's being thrown at you to get your message out? Yeah. Um, well, I'm never going to say thank you for the treatment because it was. You know, I understand your point, but it was it was very hard, especially for my family. Um, so I, I won't ever say thank you for it, but what I think is illustrative um, in, the, in this process is how powerful it is when a quote unquote regular person, whatever, someone who's not in office, someone who just cares about things, you know, sort of grabs the mic and says what they think and talks about how policies actually affect them. Because I think that's why anybody cares what I have to say at this point is that they, they feel like, okay, this is somebody who's talking about how the policies affected her and her friends and her, her regular life. And so if that's that powerful, then we all have to start doing that. And that's really how voters decide, make decisions. They make decisions based on hearing from 
other women their age, what they think about those issues, and they make decisions based on what their, their friends and family have to say to them. So that's what I've tried to take away from it, is that yes, they gave me a, you know, a bigger microphone than I might have had, but it was really powerful what we've been able to do because a regular person said something. So, um, and then the second part was how much I'm willing to sort of accept what is. Well, I think that at least for someone like myself who's been working on public interest issues for many years and has been an advocate on issues for many years, and I know there are other folks uh, like that in the room, you know, Corey's here, um, there's several people who've worked on these issues for years. We all feel a res responsibility to do everything we can to to fight for the types of social justice initiatives we believe in, and I, I firmly believe that uh, that all of us have that responsibility, and that if this uh, situation happened to to any number of people who are committed to that type of work, they would also use it to to amplify these messages. So, um, I just think I'm I'm sort of doing what I'm supposed to right now in that in that way, and and what uh, is the right thing to do. So I have a question for you. Um, given that everything is so uh, partisan right now. Um, and what, if anything, particularly on the issues that are close to your heart, do you think there might be um, forward progress um, crossing the aisles? Yeah. And sort of, and how might um, people who care about those issues get involved in making that happen? Well, there's certainly a lot of nonpartisan groups that, that do excellent work on this, whether it's you know groups like Attest that work uh, to fight human trafficking that you can volunteer for, that you can extern with, intern with. I did a lot of that during law school. It was really a, a, a valuable experience. On the, the sort of more partisan, oh, and I'll also say that there are excellent groups who are working to bring more women into office, regardless of which party they're with. You know, people like the, the Ms. Foundation or Women's Campaign Fund. Um, and that, I think, is one of the, the really important ways that we can affect uh, these issues around women's reproductive rights, specifically. I was in Ohio yesterday speaking with Representative Gwen Moore from Wisconsin. And I don't know if uh, folks remember, but a few months ago, she took to the floor of Congress and she shared her own story of being a survivor of sexual assault when a sexual assault policy was being debated. And that's just such an amazing moment and such a powerful moment because we need to have, you know, we have to have male allies and supporters. Women can't, you know, take care of their own issues entirely on their own to all be on the same page on this. But it's important that we have women in office because they have this understanding, they have this perspective. And, you know, I don't think I'm the best person to tell you what the policy should be on testicular cancer, although I'll say that the rates are high for young men and you should all be checking yourself. But, <laughs> um, but, we need to have women's perspective in office when we're talking about policies that are specific to women, especially. So there are great nonpartisan groups that are working to put more women in office who would love to have volunteers. And you know, and I know you don't have money for donations when you're in school, so I won't say donations. Um, but I also think we're actually getting to a point where we're going past the partisanship. There, I read a story recently about a young woman who is a delegate to the Republican National Convention who was t pushing to have the platform changed, to have the platform not say no exceptions for rape or incest or the life of a mother um, in terms of their, their opposition to abortion. And she was, you know, she didn't win, the platform does say that, but it was a young person's voice saying, you know, I feel like my party has gone too far. And we've had a, a number of Republicans here in New Hampshire who came out with a statement yesterday saying we feel that Mr. Romney and Mr. Ryan have gone too far, especially on women's issues. So I actually think that this particular issue is going past partisanship. And I hope, you know, I, I really do hope that the uh, Republican Party and that, you know, some Democratic members who I don't agree with on all of this um, are, are in for a course correction. I think the women in America and men who love them have uh, spoken pretty clearly that this is not what we're looking for from our elected officials. So I hope that things will be changing soon. Other questions? Yes. What's, um, what's a short-term win and what's a long-term win? <laughs> Can you be more specific? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, the, the kind of advocacy <coughs> that you're doing, it sounds like you, you have certain political inclinations and, and would like to see some things resolved in the yeah. short term, and it also seems like there is a, a larger goal that may, you know, maybe you're not striving to actually accomplish, but it's always something you're moving closer toward. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, short term, long term. Well, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is what holds many of the pieces of legislation that I've been talking about, what holds them together. And for me, at least, that's gender equality. And trying to find ways to make that, you know, that, that promise, that ethereal theory of equality, make that into reality. And so I think about that, you know, having access to contraception is something that makes it possible for women to get the education they want, to have the careers that they want, and that's how we make equality a reality for women. The Violence Against Women Act certainly does that for, for women who are victims of violence. It allows them to, to reclaim their lives by providing them with the services that they need, and that's how we make equality real and make it uh, you know, tangible and actual rather than just a, a theory that we claim in this country. I think fair pay, the bill that I've been talking about, um, there's the, the Fair Pay Act, and that's all about making what, what's already illegal, right? It's already illegal to pay women less, but making it possible for women to enforce that right in court and have it be a feasible civil suit and something that, that works well in terms, it's largely a procedural bill. Um, so that is about making the promise of equal pay a reality and giving them a way to, to achieve that equality. So I guess that's the, the short and long-term frame I've been thinking about recently, at least. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Melinda Gates's effort to expand access to contraceptive um, overseas yeah. and her effort to make that non-controversial? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's realistic? Well, there are a lot of things that I like about her effort. Um, just a little bit of background is that uh, the U.S. has a, at various points had restrictions on what funding will give to development programs if that program is willing to tell a woman, for example, where she can get an abortion. So we've had various restrictions on our funding and that has impacted our ability to get contraception into developing countries. Um, evangelical groups do a lot of work on the ground in some of these countries and um, there's a lot of problematic messaging that, that limits women's information about contraception in those ways. So the Gates Foundation and Melinda Gates specifically have been putting a lot of money on the ground and really trying to make contraception accessible. And I think that, that she's doing that because, you know, Secretary Clinton says you can tell a lot by how a country is developing and what their future is going to be by the way they treat their women. Because if a woman can't control her own reproduction, can't control timing and the number of children, that just so severely impacts her family's economic health that it, it just has a major, major impact. So I agree with it in, in terms of the goals. I think that it's very sticky how you do international development. Really needs to be about empowering women on the ground and them designing programs and making choices that are right in their cultural context and that are um, appropriate for, for their community. So um, I think that there are some, some logistics that could use a little bit of tweaking on that particular program. But in the, in the overall, I think it's really important to, to put money into that area. And I, <laughs> it should be non-controversial. I mean, my god. It's birth control. It's 2012. It's it's an important developmental tool for for every country. So, yeah, I just mostly spend my time going. It's controversial, really. Okay. Um, other questions. Um, I'm Marianne Jones. I'm the executive director of the Women's Fund of New Hampshire, and so a lot of these issues are close to my day to day work. Um, and so it's, uh, I have a, so many questions and ideas. However, I'm going to try to narrow it down. I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, agreeing 100% with everything you're saying, particularly that I think in 2012, women's rights are actually human rights. Yeah. And women's rights are social justice issues. They are no longer women's issues. It's about families. It's about mm -hmm. men and women. But um, my uh, daughter has spent a lot of time in South America and 
um, this is a little story, but people always say to her, isn't that a really macho culture? Yeah. And she said, you know, in fact, in South America, the men are so much more respectful and treat her as a teenager so much better than the mm -hmm. men and boys in the U.S. And that that was probably her most striking experience down there. And I think that we all have a lot to educate on healthy relationships for men and women. And I think there's so much behind the scenes, like the dark Twitters that you get, yeah. the tweets. It, it's because we're not raising the awareness of what's going on day to day in our communities among men and women in 2012. And I think we all owe it to you know, change the culture that is so negative and abusive of women in, the, in this country. And the last statistic is one in four females in New Hampshire will be sexually assaulted or violently assaulted in their lifetime. No one knows that, but one in seven women will have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's a higher statistic of sexual or violent assault, and yet there's no campaign. Yeah equivalent to the breast cancer campaign. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a dark and scary arena, but all the social justice issues that you're raising, I think really relies on this group of young lawyers and everybody else to rise up about it because um, we're losing mm -hmm. in the long run. Yeah, no, it's an, it's an absolute epidemic of gender-related violence in this country, and it's, it's very problematic that it's not seen as a health crisis, a criminal law crisis, um, absolutely. And I think, I haven't spent a lot of time in South America, so I, I can't speak to that part, but I try to think about the connections between the experiences of women and men in this country and other countries as well, because it's all just on a spectrum, right? The, the types of beliefs and thoughts that lead to some of the, the legislative proposals we've seen and the you know, things like the attacks on, on me are just part of a spectrum of what limits women in the, the amazingly harsh ways that we've seen, you know, not being able to drive in Saudi Arabia or um, treatment of women under the Taliban. I, you know, they're certainly different extremes, but it's all very connected and it has <coughs> some of the, the same ideas. and. I, I do completely agree that it's a human rights issue, absolutely. Yes. Um, my name is Anna Rio. I'm the International Student Advisor on campus. And I just have the, I'm just questioning, um, I'm just wondering about the, uh, when you say the access to contraception, um, you, I think my sense is that you're certainly expanding it um, to a broader scope than just uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. But my question is that, um, so how is it related to uh, human trafficking <coughs> and domestic violence? Okay. Um, so yeah, when I'm talking about access to contraception, I'm usually talking about preventative birth control as opposed to emergency contraception or abortion after the fact. In terms of connections to human trafficking, or to domestic violence, um, one of the connections that we see is that in an abusive relationship, a domestic violence situation, uh, those relationships are based on power and control. One partner exerting power over the other and controlling the other's choices, and one of the things that we sometimes see happen is not allowing a woman to, to pr use contraception when she chooses to her partner, um, limiting that in that way, um, as well as the types of sexual assaults that we see in those types of relationships. So that's one connection, is that it's a, about power and control and controlling that woman's choice. And in terms of human trafficking, um, we've seen some, some unfortunate fights over legislation that would fund human trafficking services, um, touching on this because there's you know, questions about should we fund services for a victim of sex trafficking to have access to an abortion if she needs one as a result of the, the repeated rapes that she's endured. So there are ways in which these, these issues connect, absolutely. Yeah? Thank you. I'm Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. I've been with uh, Sandra and great women here. I wanted to just say we have been unable to pass the Violence Against Women Act, which has never been a partisan issue before. In the, uh, in, in the Congress. The United States Senate 
um, was able to get the 60 votes that now seems to be the, the majority in the, in the Senate. Um, all of the uh, Republican women actually voted with um, the bill and, and passed it. In the House, the holdup seems to be some additions to the Violence Against Women Act. As Sandra uh, alluded earlier, violence is violence. So um, we wanted to add some protections for tribal women who live on reservations because um, their laws do not permit them to prosecute a non-tribal person. So if a woman is, if her partner or husband is not part of the tribe, she may have to travel hundreds of miles to get to a federal court. We wanted to give tribes the opportunity to consider those a crime on the, uh, within the tribe. Um, also, the GLBT community, um, lesbians were, and we wanted to make sure that they're added and get the same kind of protections. And the bill that passed in the House, they passed a bill, the Republican majority, would actually take away some rights of immigrant women and availability of what the, uh, of the U visa that some of you may, may, may know about that would offer them the protection. Because immigrant women face double jeopardy, not only the abuse of their um, partner, um, but deportation. Um, and so we created a, a, a special visa that would allow them that protection. So th the bill that passed in the House actually goes backwards. Um, because the Senate is unwilling to recede on the um, changes that they made to the Violence Against Women Act, and we have improved it over the, the years since, what, was it 94 when it first passed? Uh, when it first passed, and I said in a bipartisan way, um, that it is unlikely that we'll have a successful conference committee that could actually move a bill. And one more thing, I'm the chief sponsor of the International Violence Against Women Act. We were this close to getting a Republican um, sponsor, co-sponsor of that legislation, but because they see abortion under every, you know, between every line, we've been unable to get bipartisan support for the International Violence uh, Against Women Act, which is really disappointing. So in terms of short-term goals, whoever asked that, um, I see those two things as important short-term goals. Absolutely, and I would just add to that the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which again has long been bipartisan legislation, and ha we've not been able to, to get passed through either house yet. Um, even though it's, you know, it's expired, it's up for, for reauthorization. And that's just, I mean, we're talking about modern day slavery. If we can't come together on that, we have a real problem. So, yes. Um, and thank you. That's just a good segue to the question that I wanted you to address, which is um, to talk for a couple of minutes, if you would, about um, human trafficking as a domestic issue in international. Oh, absolutely. So human trafficking exists in the United States. I hope everyone's aware of that as a, a starter. There are both uh, women, men, and children trafficked into the United States from other countries, but there's trafficking that exists within the country as well, uh, US citizens who are trapped in slavery right now. So primarily for US citizens, that is often young girls who are um, taken advantage of and victimized by pimps who um, <coughs> traffic them for sexual purposes and you know are just terribly abusive conditions in addition to the repeated rapes that they endure and unfortunately in many states in this country the vast majority of states uh, it's still they can be charged with prostitution um, rather than being treated as victims of a terrible crime so the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act uh, has a three-prong approach to addressing this problem. Uh, prevention, so working on you know, putting information out into the schools and making sure that the young girls understand what they can do to, you know, what warning signs are, things like that. Making sure that parents understand how to protect their children. Also protection and prevention, protection and prosecution, prosecution thank you. Um, so prosecution, clearly a criminal justice approach to traffickers, to, to pimps and, and others. And protection is all about the services that victims need in the aftermath. Uh, counseling. Used to be the yes, Craigslist was, 
was large, and I believe that Craigslist has agreed to take down those sections of their website that were being used to advertise young girls for sexual uh, services, sexual um, violation, frankly. Um, but there are many other media sources right now. There's a campaign against um, Backpage, which is affiliated with a, a New York paper. Um, so you can find out a lot more about these campaigns online, and I encourage you to, to look it up. Check out a Tests website, um, the Alliance to End Slavery and Trafficking. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, final question. Just a comment. My name is Russ Hilliard. I'm on the adjunct faculty here, and I wanted the students to know that one of the American Bar Association's three legislative yep. priorities this year was the revitalization, the reenactment of the Violence Against Women's Act. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I was just recently at the ABA conference, and the, one of the president's priorities is human trafficking for the year. So there's some, some great work being done. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, and uh, Lindsay, do you want to have one quick question? Yeah, I have a really important <laughs> question. Um, so I don't know if someone is here from the Obama campaign, but I was just wondering if someone can talk about what we could all do to help uh, get the president reelected. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> you can volunteer. I know that they are taking volunteers. I know that there is a group um, at UNH main campus, it would be fabulous if there was one here at the law school working on behalf of the president. Honestly, like one of the most important things you can do is make sure that other students here know that they can register to vote, that they can vote here in New Hampshire, as I was talking about. You can do the election protection work. You can knock on doors and make phone calls. There are Women for Obama phone calls that are going to be happening like every Wednesday night at several of the offices um, getting started. So there's just a an enormous number of things that you can do. And I know that some of them don't sound like very much fun, like making phone calls and knocking on doors, but I've done it and it's it's actually okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a little tough getting started at first. It, you feel a little shy, but um, it's really rewarding and it's uh, a really good feeling to give information to people and to make sure that they're giving they're making an informed choice and to feel like you are affecting the the future of the country. So I encourage you to do it. Maybe you can get extra credit or something. <laughs> say, um, the, for those of you at the law school who are interested in voter protection stuff, I know Professor Amy Vorenberg is doing that with another hat on her head, so you should talk to her as well. Um, and then just... You can sign up with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just one final remark I wanted to make. Um, for those students who are actually interested in human trafficking issues, um, there is an Introduction to Human Trafficking Modern Day Slavery class that's offered in the spring that I would encourage you to take. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for being here. And we have a little gift for you. Oh, that's so nice. She's telling me I need to get interviewing for a job. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for being here today. We're a lovely group. Excellent questions. <laughs> Thank you.